how do you go from that experience to starting your own marketing company and shoe brand I realized that i started attracting a lot of clients that were in the learning and development space do you have revelation like do you have learnings from that why do people do what they do and how do you change that what's something you learned in those first couple of years running the agency huh. that was transformational for you so that's where i found that niche in the market what was the decision behind branding it as jrosario.com size of the market is big enough to cater to that particular space across the globe right hey guys welcome back to funds and founders today we have on joshua You've been a trainer at various companies in the learning space. Mm -hmm. You're currently a mentor to FI. You founded your own marketing company called Mindshare Digital. Yeah. And you also recently launched jrosario.com which is a shoe brand. That's true. Uh fun fact I think you have over 500 pairs of shoes. Yes. Um Guilty. I don't know the exact number. <laughs> You're right. But welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. We know that retention on YouTube it doesn't last more than five minutes. So if you want to plug anything, where should people reach out? What should they do? You can find us on jrosario dot com. Yeah. And also find me on Instagram. It should be Instagram dot com okay. forward slash Joshua Rosario. Okay. And we'll link everything. But awesome. um, retention, you got to plug before they drop <laughs> off. So uh, one thing I like starting with is where did you think your entrepreneurial journey started? I would say um, during college. Okay. there was something about when i had these uh, guest lectures and speakers and entrepreneurs come in you know and teach lessons during college and this is in chennai this is in chennai yeah it fascinated me okay it fascinated me to such an extent that i somehow wanted to hang around with them so i took up activities that will allow me to volunteer go pick them up from the airport to take them to the hotel and blah 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 to the extent that i remember uh, i would carry in uh, a planner uh just like they would carry right just so that i could mimic what it is so i okay. think it started off the i just like the lifestyle nice okay so, uh, cool that's what it is so how do you go from that experience to starting your own marketing company and shoe brand what happens in between interesting so um so you know i think uh, for me when i came into college um i struggled with a lot of issues especially with self confidence self esteem and that was a huge struggle and during that season one is i was very fortunate to have studied in this college that i studied at called the madras christian college in chennai more than a, it was i think i want to say more than 100 years old yeah. institute i was fortunate to have some great guys invest into me and mentor me then okay so during that course what led uh, what happened is it led me to ask this question why do i do what i do so that i could change that yeah right and that led to why do people do what they do got it and that's how i kind of got into learning and development so my my interest for for human behavior and why do people do what they do and how do you change that how to change human behavior started with that and that's when i started this training company and i was kind of in that but then what happens is you have to sell uh, you know you have to sell you have to you have to deliver the training you have to clean the office you got to do everything so as part of selling that i wanted to then understand why do people buy what they buy got it so why do people do what they do why do people buy what they buy was an extension of why do people do what they do so that's where uh, a couple of years later a friend of mine started a, a more a creative agency than a marketing agency and a great friend of mine named Ian Osh Wilson and he invited me to come on board uh, with his creative marketing agency and he was more the right brain uh, the the creative genius in terms of producing things out and i kind of would like to claim myself to be more the left brain which is doing more strategy but i was yeah. also focusing a whole lot of human behavior and consumer behavior so that's that's how the whole uh, marketing thing kind of started off and then i for some reason i eventually found myself fading away from uh, actively being in the learning and development space to pursuing more marketing okay. but interestingly i realized that i started attracting a lot of clients that were in the learning and development space so either it was a platform that was on mentoring or it was a coach uh, that was doing people development of some yeah. form or things like that so yeah okay, that's nice. what yeah before we get into clients and client acquisition stuff what did you learn uh, those questions you were trying to answer why do people do what they do and why do people buy what they buy do you have revelation like do you have learnings from that that i let me put it this way i came across something almost a decade and a half ago that when i saw that that for me was a revelation in many ways and the reason i say that is because 
One is I was like, why did nobody teach this to me? But I could say yes to everything. And here's what it is. It's a very simple framework. And it was, we produce any result or outcome based on the actions we take. Okay. Right? You take an action, you produce a certain result. But for us to take a certain action that is ingrained in our belief system about something. So I do what I do because I believe that if I do this, it'll produce this particular result. Yes. However, most often when you see people try and alter action, they say, oh, you change this, you'll get a different result. You change this, you get a different result. But here's what I realized. What triggers actions is beliefs and what triggers beliefs is experiences. Either it is your own experience or somebody else's experience. So let's look at this. At the foundation of it is experience. My experience about something creates a belief system yes. about something. And what that belief system leads to a certain action and that particular action produces results. So one of the things I started doing differently was instead of trying to change action, I said, I want to change experience. Because if I can change experience, I'll change your belief system. If I change your belief system, I'll change your action. If I change your action, I'll change the results. So I started doing that with learning and development. So we then went into what we would call experiential learning. Okay. Right? And also think about it, right? Uh, honestly, we forget what we've read. If I read something, even if I read something two days ago, three days ago, I can forget. But we don't forget experiences, even if though they've been something I've experienced yeah. 20 years ago, 30 yeah. years ago, right? So we honed a whole lot on experience. And then when I started getting into marketing and branding, I said, how do I create experiences. And so I little did I know, understand this whole idea of so-called, uh, you know, consumer experience or customer experience. You know, for me, the idea was how do I just create experience so that it can change people's belief, get them to do something that I want to so that they can produce a certain action. So we started doing a lot of crazy uh, fun stuff during so-called uh, experiences, right? So do we have a few seconds for yeah, a yeah, example? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, one experiment we did was to create an ad for a, a peel that was designed to remove blemishes. So what we did is we said, if you look at it, the fundamental idea of experience is to engage as many human senses as you can. So we said, how do we create that? So traditionally, if you look at most creams or face peels that tell you that it'll remove face blemishes, it will just be a a face and we'll have like a before, before after, yeah, yeah. you know, one picture and, you know, yeah. we said, no, 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 we want to create experience. So experience would mean engage as many human senses as we can. So we created this one page that when you looked at it would show you a face with blemishes, but at the corner of it, you would peel out, peel that off. So when you do that, it takes away the blemishes and now you're seeing a face with no blemishes, right? And two things. So one, I got the visual already done there. I got the experience of touch and feel, and I also got the smell because as soon as you open that, you could feel the fragrance, you could sense got the it. fragrance. This is a physical thing. This is a physical thing, Okay, right? got it, got it. So the idea was, you know, how yeah. do you create that? And of course, I've tried to translate some bit of that into digital uh, in different formats, but that was just one example yeah, yeah. Uh, of how I think that, that I think was very, very proud of what we created nice. out there, yeah, so. Um, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So you're doing L&D stuff, you're going to marketing, you. Let's talk about your first sale, right? Mm. Like, what was your first sale? How hard was it? How long did it take? And what was your feeling after that sale? Okay. And this can be either for the L&D company or your marketing. Yeah. Pick whatever. That's, yeah. Um, so, you know, how I even fell into sales, right? So, I was into learning and development. I enjoyed it. You know, just the thrill of it. And it was very exciting. But I wasn't getting paid a whole lot because I was a, a, a junior. And, you know, you need to have a little gray hair, yeah. uh, especially in this space, right? For me, the only gray hair that I had was during the course of the college, I had some great guys invest into my life and I could see that transformation happen in my own life. So I said, hey, I want to pass this on. So so I went to my boss and I said, boss, our uh, learning and development is doing great, but there's only X I'm making. I want to make more. He said, sure. He said, why don't you go and sell training? And I thought it would be pretty easy. And selling training was, and I want to say, the second hardest thing to sell after insurance. Because you are trying to promise them a transformation that is so subjective, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. It's not like you you pay this, you get this, row, yeah. right? You you deliver a training program, person X will experience the transformation in the same room, person Y will not. And then you can't claim and say, hey, but we produced results yeah. that we didn't produce. So learning and development was very, very hard. Uh, selling learning and development was very hard for me initially. 
but that is what led me to understand hey why are people buying what they're buying right so i think for me my experience of then trying to sell that i remember uh, there was a particular institute uh, in india called national institute of fashion technology and uh, that's when i was my boss just threw me out he says go and sell this training program and come back and all i had to do was apply human behavior into the whole selling uh, experience so if i could uh, share one illustration nobody likes to be sold to yeah right and i looked at my own self i said i don't like the idea when somebody's trying to sell anything to me Uh, so I remember uh, you want to be the decision maker yeah, right you want to be like I want this I call I you I'm buying it on my this. terms yeah. and conditions yeah, right yeah. nobody else and you also there's this whole control yeah. play into it right so I remember uh, by the way in the learning and development space uh, whenever a vendor or a client is looking for somebody to do their uh, learning and development there are a couple of vendors who are pitching yeah so this was a particular situation there were a couple of vendors that were invited and they were all asked to pitch one after the other funny enough for whatever reason we were the last ones that were invited to come in and pitch and my opening statement when i walked in there was ladies and gentlemen i have nothing to sell to you what i'm going to share with you is over the last few years this is what we've done and this is the kind of transformation we've done and this is the kind of results we produced and this is how we've done it if any of that inspires you we can continue to talk if not it was nice meeting you and that was my intro to then getting into my pitch did i still make a pitch yes i still made a pitch but, but guess positioning what? yes but i Our was pitch. able to grab their attention and also think about it by the time they've gone through six seven of them and everybody's doing the same effort of trying to convince you why they're better than the rest of them you're tired you're frustrated and you're in your mind you're like not one more guy and how i could change that experience for them right so i think i think those are some of the uh, the idea was you know again how do i change somebody's experience yeah. so that i can get them to change their action yeah. and results i feel like in india especially like there's this phrase right ki chuna laga diya ha ki right. like as in the reason indians don't like being sold to is you have this scare that the person in front of you is taking advantage yeah. selling you an inferior product whatever True. right and so and if i could i think unfortunately that's create this this whole perception that sales is bad yeah yeah right uh, and it took me time to really understand it differently i, th- I think uh, i mean it has no credit to whether being in india or us but i was fortunate enough to listen to a few guys here and they talked about you want to think about creating value creation yeah. fundamentally right if you can create value and i'm not saying people are not scammy yes they are uh, but also people don't often know how to make a decision Yeah. So in your sales process you want to help them make the decision and you know that you're fiduciary you're doing you're doing whatever you're doing to serve their interest as part of this whole engagement yeah so cool um so you're se- you're in the learning and dev space at some point you move on to the marketing company yes. right your role in the market company is it, it it's more strategy more yes. business processes yes what sales what's what's something you learned in those first couple of years running the agency huh. that was transformational for you i think one of them was is especially in a, in an agency business right it's very competitive yeah 100% number 2 entry barrier is so low right because you you don't necessarily have to have a certain landing agent. page and agency exactly yeah. and third clients don't know how it's subjective yeah. is that good or it's not good right so you're against this whole um industry that that is like i said you you don't need a certification uh you you can be a 10th grader who can create a logo and you can be somebody who's gone to some of the finest design school and create a logo and yeah. most people do not even know what the difference is so the challenge was how do we differentiate and um my my partner then introduced me to a book called martin humor Okay. Uh book called The Brand Gap by Martin Humer and I think that for us was very fascinating. Okay. So it was almost like you had this intelligence natively but you didn't know how to put it together and present it. And Martin Humer simply said most creative thinking uh, or most advertising, most marketing that you see is very right brain, very creative. However, it misses out the strategic element to it. and that is what i was able to bring to the table why my partner was was an expert with creative so i think we were able to stitch that story together not just from a story point of view but even from a deliverables point of view which i think was very magical for us that helped us really stand out uh, you know as compared to others in the market because and and we would our statement would be things like we don't want someone coming to your website and saying wow who built this website it looks so pretty 
We want somebody to come to your website and say, hey, I want to do business with you. And for that to happen, you want to be able to bring in the strategic side of understanding your business, your website, or any creative is just a visual representation of your business on a more strategic side. So I think for me, that was a huge learning uh, to be able to, and I think that just changed everything we did from there onwards. And we could charge four times more than what everybody else was yeah. charging because, you know, and there was value creation happening. Like as part of that whole discussion, we're talking to clients before we, I mean, we would talk to our clients' clients before we started an engagement, which is what most agencies did not do. And the reason we do is we want to understand what, what, Keeps you the, here. What keeps you? What do you like? What is it you don't like? Why would you? We even would talk to people who did not do business with them. And then the second part we would do is after we do the deliverable, after we've created some version of the prototype, we would then get the clients to then give them feedback again. So, you know, all this was something that really helped clients. And I could tell you that I want to say 90% of our clients came from referral. Nice. Again, not that because we were great at delivering something, but we just had a very different approach to how we wanted to deliver something. Got it. I said anybody could deliver the creative stuff. Respectfully, I hope my partner then doesn't hate that. What I meant is we, we brought that element that had made this thing more. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. If you were to start an agency again, what's one thing or a couple of things you would do differently? Like we said, I think... Um, one of the things that I did not do uh, is early on, I did not build systems and processes, yeah. right? And and I don't know if this is a challenge with everybody else in the agency space, but the value that you primarily bring to the table is in your head. And the understanding that nobody else can do it better than you can do, to some extent there's truth to it, but then it's never going to be scalable. And I found myself to become the bottleneck every time, right? So I think that would be one of the first things that I would do differently, that all of these great ideas that we brought to the table, it never had a system or a process to it. And I said that would be something that I would have done differently, which is what we started doing a little differently when we came to starting this agency that we currently Nice. Are. Yeah. Pretty cool. When did you f buy your first pair of shoes? Uh, I don't know when, but I can tell you the first pair pair of nice shoes I was gifted. I was in my seventh grade. Okay. And this was my dad's friend. Butter? Uh, no, this <laughs> wasn't butter. But this was some other, uh, I think I had a butter later on. Okay. I definitely had a butter later on. But uh, this was, uh, I want to say a lesser known brand, but from a quality point of view, uh, little did I know, you know, I didn't know a whole lot of quality in my seventh grade. But I could just tell, and my dad could also tell because he was far more seasoned, that this was much better. Uh, but there's an interesting story to it that right growing up humble beginnings just had this one pair of shoe uh, and I keep talking about this every time because it's very very personal to me and I would wear the same shoe to school polish to it every party, morning and you know whether I used to polish it <laughs> was a different story you know uh, and I'll come to that uh, but there was just one pair of shoe and I remember you know the 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 soles were worn out and I remember one evening uh, this friend of my dad um, he, you know, he just told me, Chal beta, chalte which meant, hey, yeah, let's yeah, go, yeah, yeah. you know, for a for road trip. Not really road trip, but, you know, just drive around. Yeah. And he took me to this uh, shoe store. And I believe he was a very loyal customer to the shoe store. And he told this guy, Sabse badia wala juta dikhao. Give him the best shoe. And that gentleman took out a pair of shoes that just looks so beautiful, man. Uh, so I, have it? I don't have that, uh, unfortunately. But... I couldn't sleep the whole night. Just this excitement that next day morning, you know how it is, we wear yeah, uniform, right? Yeah, yeah, in, yeah. in our schools in India. Next day morning, I'm going to get up and I'm going to wear this uh, nice new pair of shoe and walk, man. It was amazing. It it just changes changed the way I walked into school right. that day. It just changed the way I carried myself. And ever since, I think the obsession began. Nice. Somewhere around there. Yeah. Nice. When did you um, start collecting? Or like... I don't know if collecting is the right word, but at some point it goes from I have shoes for use. Yes, yes. I have. Uh, yes, you're right. Shoes because I like so them. So I think uh, it's, it's very interesting because there have been very strong landmarks in my life that have led me to where this is where it is today, right? And for me um, was when I went to pursue higher education in Chennai. And here's why. So when I looked at shoes around you know, most traditional stores like Bata, which is Bata is there. Liberty also is there in yeah, India, right? Yeah. Is that my thinking was they are 
everybody wears the same kind of shoe, right? I mean, and there's something about, hey, I want something that's that's unique and different, and you know. And um, so what happened interestingly in Chennai, which some folks may know, some may not, Chennai is a huge market for export shoes. Oh, I didn't know this. Especially for the European market and the US market. Oh, some of the biggest US brands that you talk about, including European brands, are all made in, either they're made in Chennai or they're made in a factory in Ambur, is considered the mecca of shoemaking in okay. India. And Chennai usually being where they shipped out from because it's And there's all shipping. kinds of shoes. Yes. No, but mostly leather. Sorry. No, no, okay, no. Okay. Yeah, you're leather. talking about mostly dress shoes. Okay, kind of thing, it, right? okay. So, uh, and if you're familiar with how the whole business works, right? So if your shoes don't meet a certain quality standard, the whole lot gets rejected. Yeah. Now, the shoe manufacturer has to recover the money that he spent in making those shoes. So what a lot of these shoemakers would do is they would strip the brand off of it and sell it in the local market. Pennies on the dollar, literally. So I happened to one fine day accidentally land on land up in this street that only had those kind of shoes. Okay. So all export quality, uh, beautiful shoes that, and they looked exceptionally beautiful. Uh, they were designed differently. They looked beautiful. They looked different. Uh, and by the time I had some understanding of quality. So that is where, and, and they would cost me pennies on the dollar. And that is where I was like, man, I can really live my dream of trying to have more than just a black shoe and a brown shoe, just have two pairs. So that's when I started kind of slowly nice. uh, saving up and I would go and buy those shoes there. And yeah, I think eventually in college, uh, I kind of became this guy where my friends would come and borrow my shoes uh, just because they had to go in for an interview. And uh, most often they would return it. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's where it started off. And okay. then eventually as I started, because it's an expensive hobby. Yeah. Uh, you know, some of my shoes are $800, $1,000 now. You know, I could not afford them even if I was in India. But, you know, as, over a period of time, I started making more, you know, I, I started investing more in them. Nice. I also realized they're nicer quality shoes. Yeah. Nice. So, yeah. And so, talking about your company now, jrosario.com, mm. how, how does this go from, I got a shoe in seventh grade, <laughs> to it became an obsession in college, to let me start my own brand? Yeah. So, I blame my dad for that. Uh, my dad used to serve the armed forces. And there's something about the armed forces that they're extremely particular about, especially in India, was... Um, attire. Attire. Yeah. Huge, right? And I come from a family, or rather I would say my, my dad comes from a family where his father served with the armed forces, his brother served with the armed forces. It was kind of like a family thing, right? So, the rule that my dad had was, you can tell a great deal about a man by the shoe he wears. And he told that to me more because he wanted to ensure that I polish my shoes. So yeah. that's where the whole idea of, I was not so much into polishing shoes, but I'm like, who cares, who sees, and things like that. Or well, my dad would, because he wanted me to ensure that the shoes are polished, and they're not just brushed. Like polish is when you apply wax mm -hmm. on it and do all of that stuff, right? So I think that's where I kind of really got obsessed with the idea of that man, you can tell a great deal about a man by the shoe he wears. And I'll tell you, that is so true today. I can tell a great deal about a man by the shoe he wears. I can tell you, you know, are they, do they have an eye for detail? Are they a quality conscious person? Uh, I could tell you to some extent, did the person walk in and come or did a person drive? Uh, could tell you to some extent what the profession is, blah, 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 right? There's so much that I could, you know. And uh, I, think, I think that's where it kind of started off. And uh, sometimes, you know, it, for example, I, I can... I can very comfortably wear a red shoe and walk around in which most of my friends may not be able to resonate with that idea. But for me, it was just like, hey, you know, I can, uh, to the extent that now I can look at somebody and say, there could be a potential for our brand. And not everybody uh, is a potential for our brand. Uh, and what I mean by that is I can look at what the shoes, what shoes they're wearing and socks they're wearing. The socks complements that. So I think, I think that's where it kind of started yeah. off with. And um, long story short, I started having this shoe collection that I started building and I said, it's an expensive hobby. And a uh, couple of years ago, um, I was having this conversation with a uh, young kid. Uh, you, I, you're familiar with Rajesh Sethi, the gentleman yeah, yeah. introduced us, right? So Rajesh is a great mentor. His son, Sumuk Sethi, a smart kid. I want to say he's probably 10, 12 years younger than me. He ended up having dinner and uh, uh, this is when we lived in the Bay Area, and, and Samuk says, hey, Josh, uh, have you ever considered doing, uh, getting into the shoe business? And I was like, no. I said, I said, why do you say that? He said, well, you know, you're just so passionate about it. You know so much about it. And, you know, you talk about it day in and day out. And I would really get excited when you talk about shoes. It shows up, right? 
He says, uh, you know, there's a there's an opportunity for for something like that. So I spent, I think I, that evening when I when we left after dinner, it really got me to think about maybe, maybe there's some truth to it, right? So I think it was also a, a wiser alternative <laughs> to not spending money on an expensive hobby, yeah. right? So that's what kind of got me to think about it. And that's where it led to me trying to research about that topic. Then when I realized that I knew enough, or rather I knew more than an average Joe would know about shoes. And that's when I started looking at what the different markets that produce shoes. So India is a huge market that produces. Vietnam is another one. Indonesia is another one. Uh, Italy. China is another one. Um, Spain is another one. Right. So these are uh, huge, I like to call them centers of shoe manufacturing of different types. Right. So that's when I started visiting these countries and, you know, getting to try out different samples and things like that. And yeah, and I want to say four years later, uh, or three years and six months later is when we Launch. eventually launched. Yes. What was the decision behind branding it as jrosario.com versus? So, yes, a lot of people ask me this, that it sounds narcissist. <laughs> but the truth is, uh, uh, not necessarily. My dad's name is Joseph Rosario. Yeah. And that's the J Rosario there. Okay. So he was the inspiration to it. But I was like, ah, I could borrow a little from that too. So yeah, that's where it kind of came in. And I wanted something that's going to be short, that's going to be unique. And uh, so that's how J Rosario happened. I want to give credit to a friend of mine uh, who might listen to this podcast because I was really struggling with trying to come up with a name. And I was reaching out to a few friends of mine, just so mass messaging my friends and saying, hey guys, do you have any some idea? And this gentleman, name is Jinsu, college friend from Australia. He said, have you considered uh, this name? I'm like, wow, I never. And it just, there was no going yes. back, no turning back from there, yeah. And so in in building this brand, what's what's been the journey like? So like you launch, you have a site up, mm. uh, you're doing a lot of custom shoes, right? So you probably have a lower conversion from someone sees the site to let me go buy a site. Oh, yeah. What's been that journey of building this? I know you're still newer into it. Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, you know, to clarify, uh, only because the word custom is so generally thrown, yeah, loosely yeah. thrown as, uh, and uh, because in industry folks would hate if I use the word custom because it's they're not necessarily custom. Custom custom would mean somebody comes down, measures your feet right down to the got it, got it. smallest millimeter and seeing how your feet arches and everything. We're more what we would like to call customized shoe. Okay, got it. Uh, it's a little play on words, but it helps clarify. So what we looked at it as, and I said, you know, I looked at, you know, when we moved from California to Austin, Texas, we bought a house and I was like, you know what, I'm going to put all my shoes out here to, for the first time, see what they look like. So I put out all of them. Do you have a photo of that? Yeah, I have a photo of that. So we, we share it after we'll yeah, put it yeah. up right here. But it's not about 500, much lesser than. Yeah. But I had this whole game room filled up with all of my shoes. And I looked at them and I was like, you know what, 80% of them are black and brown. Yeah. And I was like, there's more to my personality. Because keep in mind, we dress up in a certain way and it's usually, it's an expression of our personality, right? For some, it can be about impressing others, but it's usually about expression of who you are that comes out, right? And I said, clothing gives you the option to express whatever is unique, yeah. right? If I want to wear a red suit, I can. If I want to wear a purple suit, I can. But I, like, if I want to wear a red shoe in a certain model, I could not do that. Uh, or rather, there wasn't, there weren't too many people in the market offering that. And if they were, you would then go for a custom shoe. That's about $2,000, right? So that's where I found that niche in the market. And I said, you know what? Hey, there are not a whole lot of people, but at the same time, the size of the market is big enough to cater to that particular space across the globe, right? So that's when we said we want to create shoes that are traditionally not black and browns. And also, I think there's, there's, there's a personality to that element, which is the bold, the courageous, the ones who are ready to break the rules. Not break the rules for the sake of breaking the rules. Break the rules to say that, hey, I I don't necessarily follow a path that was taken, right? So that for me was what I wanted to represent because in many ways that was me, right? The the road less taken would represent me. The, the Steve Jobs would represent me uh, in some way. So for me, that was the idea. So we said, Jay Rosario, we would do black and browns uh, more because we want to cater to our existing client who might need a black and brown, but we're vastly about this brand that says a brand that can help you express your unique style, bold style, yeah. personality. So 
with that, we kind of started doing these shoes and we started doing uh, two formats of it. Like I asked you in the beginning, hey, uh, my goal is not to put these shoes on display here, but the idea was to kind of demonstrate yeah. that, right? So one of the things that uh, is a hallmark of what we do is we do hand-painted patina shoes. Okay. So what that simply means is if I could show, now this is, um, this is not really a white shoe. This is a shoe or a leather which is called crust. Okay. Uh, this is made like this at the tannery. It's an unfinished leather. And we first go through the process of making the shoe. And then we have an artist Paint who it. works on painting them like these. Okay. Right? So we do two formats of it. One, uh, of course, these are two different shoe models, but I wanted to show one. We have an option which says, hey, you come here. We have 21 different models to pick from. And you can pick any one of those models, customize every element of it, which would mean, hey, I want this model and I want to have a different sole. Like yeah. this one's a leather sole, but you want to have a rubber sole or whatever yeah. that looks like. And then you can go and say, I want to have a different kind of hand painting done on it. Got it. So it's very boutique with what we kind of do. So this is one side of what we kind of, uh, we kind of lead with in yeah. terms of part of this. The the second one that we do is uh, like this is this is a version right so this is hand recent, painted this is not hand painted okay. this is an interesting one though so this one is that we take we take the leather like this but before the shoe is made we just spread the leather and then we paint it with a brush the whole leather is painted yeah like and the whole then, hide just yeah, the whole hide yeah. right and then we cut the pieces out of it and then we stitch them together got it, got right it. so like this sole is different uh, yeah. this one's got the rubber. the rubber indentation on it but uh, this is the one that we're kind of now preparing to uh, launch we've been we've done a lot of you know ones for our existing clients but we've never launched for the public which is where you can come in on our shoe customizer uh and then you can come in and say, I want to build a shoe that's extremely unique. So if you see the leather on this is a different leather, the leather on this is a different one. And, you know, we've got broguing, we call them. It's here. The last of this one or the toe shape is very different than some of the other ones yeah. that you see. And then the sole is different, right? This one's got the lug sole or commando sole. So the, the customized one simply says, I want to come in and pick a different toe shape and I want to be able to change the different uh, yeah. materials to it, colors to it, sole to it. So again, I said, you know, expresses my personality and I'm not a traditional black and brown kind of shoe. Nice. Yeah. What's the average price point of a... So the one that we're looking at being able to launch, these are going to be about 250 or so. That's not bad. Yeah. Now these are Blake stitch shoes, which simply means that they can be resold. The hand painted ones would be anywhere from 375 $400 and above. Uh, because it's a two-step process. One, you make the shoe, yeah. and then you have an artist. We So we do hand painting at both levels. We do it at the factory also. And then we also work with award-winning patina artists. You know, like this one is done by one uh, patina artist by the name Greg. Uh, the guy lives in New York. Extremely good, you know. Didn't even know patina artist was a thing. Right. Yeah. And uh, it's, just, it's just fabulous, man. I mean, I'm also wearing one by another great friend of mine, uh, a patina artist, award-winning patina artist, Alberto Suastes. He's in Arizona. Uh, just does some amazing stuff, right? So yeah, we take them and then the protein artist nice. works on the magic. Yep. What was the first sale like? So I've heard stories of uh, you open shop and then it's crickets, right? Uh, I think I probably was a little wise on this move. Uh, and what I did a little differently was to kind of do an interest campaign first and say, hey, we're gonna be launching something. Uh, and if you're interested, uh, sign up. So we did that and we locked the store access. You had to request store access. So, and then- uh, So how many signups did you get in the, the I, So we only did it for friends and family. Okay. Uh, I wanna say we got almost about 200, nice. 225 signups out of it. And then, interesting enough, and what's the lesson learned? Uh, a gentleman, and this was much before the we kind of went live. Yeah. A gentleman by the name Peter Harrison, uh, amazing friend, great mentor. He told me early on, uh, "Hey Josh, uh, when you're gonna buy, uh, when you're gonna launch, I want to be customer number one." So I knew that was gonna come. It was about it was about ensuring the store is open, and then he becomes customer number one. So that was there. But I think for me, the biggest 
biggest aha moment was when we got um i want to say it was a 1200 dollar order uh, on the second day of us opening the store nice. from a total stranger somebody told this person about our shoe brand and the gentleman goes out and orders two patina shoes and two matching belts and for me that was mind blowing because nice. a total stranger right nice yeah so yeah sweet and then since then um how how has sales been are you doing marketing is it get a shoe a day or like i don't know what yes I, yes so we have not aggressively done marketing as such so two things that we've done is we focused on a whole lot of family and friends yeah. initially uh, also because i wanted to kind of test the waters and see what's working what's not working and things like that number one number two is uh, i am part of quite a few uh, facebook communities uh, of shoe enthusiasts and shoe aficionados so just being able to cater to them uh, has in many ways been overwhelming in a good way nice. right so because you know these are guys who talk shoes eat shoes drink shoes live shoes uh so that's that's been but we're now kind of prepared to very soon start getting out and reaching out to the public uh outside of these communities that we're part of and be able to little, be a lot more aggressive with what we're trying to market nice pretty yeah. cool i have a bunch of random ideas that oh sure I, but uh, uh there's a couple like leather journals ah that have a very distinct audience of people who've been doing leather working yes and i think they would appreciate a product like this more on that magazine right now all that all the only ads you see are tools mm by this leather tool that tool this uh, whatever you know there's something very interesting that you mentioned you know because of the love for shoes i am drawn to leather in general for a lot of factors one it's just natural and craftsmanship right so if i were to have a shaving pouch not if i were my shaving pouch is leather adopted um, yeah yeah my 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 watch holder is leather right so you would see that it just extends mm-hmm. into so many other areas my my bag laptop bag would be leather my ipad case would be leather so you're right i think uh, there's definitely that the people who love leather uh, or leather shoes are yeah yeah are you capturing emails oh yes yeah. oh yes yeah because i feel like a lot of i've i've talked to some like early stage ecom folks mm. who are like oh yeah i'm doing this selling to that like i'm but they're not capturing their audience because once they do launch mm. and they become a thing mm. you need to go retarget everyone who's interested in your brand mm. right and so it's a, it's a very basic thing that sometimes people miss out on yeah that's interesting that you say that right because think about it um, just because somebody saw an ad they're not going to take the car out and go and buy right. that particular thing right So I want to be able to find a way to continue to engage with them yeah. you know as to when they're ready to buy you know then I want to be in terms of their that's where the whole mind share thing yeah. comes right I want to be able to occupy enough mind share It's like Coke and Pepsi at this point are not running ads to get sales they're running ads so that when you go to decide to buy one or the other you're right you're like oh coke because for whatever reason you just saw then you're right some, some shit like you're right you're right no you're right i mean whatever whatever is occupying your mind share yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah like i'll tell you when i think of tools for some reason i'm always thinking of home depot like it just naturally comes to me right and i was like loaves ne aisa kya bigada hai right yeah. i've not had a bad experience with loaves or anything yeah. but i think of home depot for anything and i and then i realize oh but there are there are closer options that are there i don't have to drive 7 miles to get to home depot there's a place closer sometimes let's say to get small screws right and i think they've done mind share right yeah i agree what's the biggest challenge you have with jerozari.com right now oh there are there's so many of them uh, but i think um it's an aspirational product okay right so it's not um think about it right it's not like i want shoes so i'm going to come and buy from you yeah. right i want shoes i'll go and buy the cheapest one out there um so that's one number two is this leads me into this whole idea of people traditionally just don't know enough so education is a huge part and what i mean by education of is that most people who look at this say oh all these shoes look beautiful right so i want to talk about this Did you know that of all of these shoes this is the crappiest shoe yeah. and I purposely brought it for you is because the reason I say this is crappiest is for multiple reasons but hey the model looks good and all of that is because most people don't know 
right? Uh, so I think our biggest challenge is uh, educating the market yeah. about this because traditionally, if I want to go buy a pair of shoes, I'm just going to go spend two hundred, three hundred dollars at a store and buy a pair of shoes because it looks good, right? But the truth is that you could probably get something like this, which honestly, just to make this would have costed less than twenty bucks. Literally, no exaggeration, because I've seen these factories do that stuff. But this is just the crappiest quality of shoe that you could end up buying. So I think for us, being able to educate folks. Number two, I think uh, because of the quality we're focused on producing, um, there has to be an interest for craftsmanship. Yeah. Because this, as I said, is a 10-step process to build this. This is 122 steps to build. Uh, this is craftsmanship. This is not craftsmanship. They look the same almost, right? So you really have to have a flair for craftsmanship yeah, yeah. to want to do that. And the third thing that I get asked this very often is why would somebody want to pick up these shoes? And I said, you want to step back and think about it. It's, it's very often, it doesn't lead with the shoe. It leads with who you are personally. And that has to come to this, it comes to this idea that are you personally quality conscious? Like yeah. quality is subjective, right? But there's this basic bare minimum benchmark that says, I want to buy a shoe that's resolable. I want to buy a shoe that has decent leather quality. Uh, so I think it very often starts with the individual before you get to the shoe. Yeah. So those are some of the challenges for us to be able to identify Ex people who are, you know, hey, quality also conscious. Also communicate that, right? Communicate that. You have to be drawn to craftsmanship. You have yeah. to be drawn to artistry. And and not have and spend the same amount of money and get a crappy pair of shoes. Yeah. yeah. It's funny you say craftsmanship. So like I do a bunch of like leather. I know, I know, stuff, right? I know. So I've gone to a lot of fairs where I'll see people with a stall. Right? Okay. I'm like, okay, let me go see what they have. I, I don't know if this is just pessimistic in nature, but I'll pick up a wallet or a bag. I'm like, I can see that you didn't spend time stitching this. You didn't yeah. spend time finishing the edges. And yes. I know I don't even, I'm not, I've only been doing it three, four years. Yes. So I don't even know everything that I can know. But I can tell that I know you did not spend time doing this, yes. right? Like you just cut it, put it in, like I need to go to a show. Yes. And I see, oh my God, it's handmade. It's so nice. I'm just like, yeah. I know that I could do better. Yeah. Even if I spend very little time. Yes. But it's just the effort hasn't gone into yeah. finishing it, right? And at that point, I'm like, people, again, don't know. They want handcrafted. They want a yes. leather product, right? Yes. You don't even know what kind of quality leather. It could be great sea high. True, true. And you think it's leather, exactly. but it's finished. Exactly. So it looks it looks yeah. like good leather, yeah. right? Yeah. But Yeah, like I said, um, this this and this, you'll say, hey, the leather, they, they're both a leather. Yeah, they're true. But they're two different, totally different yeah. quality of leathers. You're right. Yeah. I think there is some truth to it. Not this, all of it is true in the sense, when you pay, when you pay, Two hundred odd dollars for a pair of shoe, you get X. When you pay five hundred dollars, you get Y. You, when you pay two thousand dollars, you get Z, right? And uh, and you should also be prepared to say, hey, this is what I get, right? Mm -hmm. When you buy a two thousand dollar shoe, the level of finish that you get, the yeah, the leather quality is much much superior. I had a friend who had a leather bag, and the handle patinaed. The handle was mm. normal wedge tan color, and it patinaed. And she's nice. like, oh, the handle's dirty now. I'm like, ah. It's, not it's you not see, that's where but, education is right and like there's a bunch of people on youtube who will get louis vuitton bag uh -huh. to switch out the handle because the handle's dirty it's maybe a little bit dirty but like it's patinaed yeah and it's, it's lost its original color yes but you don't need to put a new handle in there no but yeah that's that, that's one thing so you see education is a challenge for us especially yeah. in this 80 90 percent of folks that you will see walk around with dress shoes and of course i'll hate saying this but the generally one is the dress shoe is a dying industry uh, but also Goodyear welted shoes or resolable shoes itself is a dying industry in general. But you're right, because folks are not educated, not aware of it, uh, and by the way, talking about brands like Louis Vuitton, great brand, but I'm not saying uh, all branded are great quality. I mean, you'll be surprised how yeah, some of I these know. big brands just sell you. Like, yeah. I have access to the same kind of leather that Louis Vuitton has. Yes. Like, I can go to the same tannery. Exactly. I can buy the same kind of leather, yes. right? Yes. Um, maybe they do custom lines and custom colors and yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, the, the tannery manufacturing yes. process is the same. It is the same. You're right. So, theoretically, I have the same quality. Yes. 
now i may not have the same craftsmanship cuz i'm not doing it for 30 years sure and the brand also yeah yes yeah. but the product is, so oh, there's this guy on youtube who just buys bags and cuts them yes and opens the leather yes. and shows the stitches yes. like you know this is a 130 dollar bag this roughly 40 dollars of material not yep. a bit but then he'll open, he'll tear apart like a coach bag yes like this is not worth 400 dollars exactly because it's 30 dollars of material they have like an aligning that's cheaper blah, blah, blah. Yeah. so and then also this idea channel. that you know we we find our identity in the brand we wear and walk around with that's consumerism right yeah so <laughs> cool um couple questions i like to ask towards the end uh uh-huh. what's your tech stack how do you run your company so right now a lot of folks are going to laugh on this but i'll tell you there's a reason Excellent. We run on WooCommerce. Okay. And here's why. So we we do WooCommerce and we've stitched together a multiple things. Uh, now, should everybody who's starting out do that? No, not necessarily. I have the luxury of doing that because I have an internal team that's technically very smart and then can do it. But one of the primary reasons we want to do that and I can so confidently say I think that was one of the best decisions we did was we keep pivoting and what i mean by pivoting is sorry maybe pivoting not the right word we we made so many changes to our woocommerce platforms depending on how our customers were responding to what they wanted and what they did not want right if i built a platform that was built on let's say shopify or one of those tools one i don't have expertise in house expertise to do that secondly i it would be far more expensive for me to engage a third party agency or a company and the speed at which i can change for example i want something changed i can let my team know in the evening next morning i get up it's all done because of the team that sits in india and philippines so uh, we we primarily use woocommerce and all of the associated plugins nice that come along with it uh, in terms of email marketing we use clavio okay uh, which i think is a great tool i think they are uh, overpriced but okay they are overpriced they are overpriced but then you know i'll tell you the, the the this this might be my ignorance part is there's this whole switching cost yeah that happens and i was like you know eventually this is what something i might eventually need uh, but if you ask me did i need a clavio no i could have gone with free ones also yeah, yeah. right but i just said i just don't want to take of yeah. the yeah. yeah right so we we use that and then um, for our customer service we use uh, twilio for our calls and uh, messaging and things like that and then we use a uh, help desk platform okay. for our chat and ticketing system nice. so that's that's primarily which is more on the front end side of things and then uh, for our shoe customizing we use uh, a 3d configurator okay that uh, helps you customize your shoes nice yeah pretty cool yeah. what are three resources that you'd recommend for someone starting out with regard to starting out agency and or brand and or just venturing into the entrepreneurship space so i don't know if if there would be um, a whole lot of them would be resources but they can be podcast yes, guides yes, yes. whatever like so one is the one i would say is the e myth Okay. Uh, I'm sure you. I haven't read it. Oh, no. so it, it it was game changing for me more okay. because okay. the idea what of Michael Gerber was the idea that you have to get out of the business okay. and see it. So, which I did not do early on. Um I am in the process of now doing that. So now what I do is like we talked about it that it's too early for me to build systems and processes, but it's never too early for me to document things. And yeah. Rajesh Shetty, you know, my mentor is huge on that. So, what I right now do is just document things nice. with the goal that I want to get out of the operational side of running this on a day-to-day basis. Nice. So, Emit is a great book for anybody to look at it. As I said, too early to write system then process, but you want to think about getting out of your uh, this thing one. Uh number 2 is I get asked this question very often if I want to start a business, where do I start? Two resources if this may be. Number 1, look at what's the mecca of your product. right for example we looked at shoes and i'm like okay what are all the countries uh, that are known or they considered the mecca for shoe making so th- that was india that was china that was spain there's italy vietnam indonesia is more handmade uh, but that that's that's one so start with that and number 2 is there is a facebook group for pretty much everything under the sun sign up into as many as you can and keep listening i am so grateful for the insights the advice the friendships that i've gathered from total strangers who come alongside with this journey and given me inputs which i otherwise would have not had so i would say these would be a couple of things to hopefully help someone if they want to kind of start off uh, 
And um, I think the last bit, I don't know if this is a resource, but advice more in terms of think lean in terms of, and I mean by think lean is that we all get excited and say, oh, I have this dream idea and I'm going to work on it. And then you go out and spend all of that money only to realize that your customers are telling you something very differently. Yeah. So, and I've made those mistakes, spent a whole lot of money, you know, buying inventory, holding inventory and doing things only to realize that my hottest selling product is not the inventory that I'm holding, but it's something else. Nice. So it's perfectly fine for you to spend more uh, and hold lesser inventory or do things till you've not figured out what your customer's really looking for. Nice, pretty cool. Yeah. I do this bit where I ask everyone a last question. Okay. So I asked my previous guest for a question and I'll ask you one for my next okay. guest. So your question is, outside of your industry, who do you find inspiration from? And is there someone that you've looked to for mentorship that's oh. not in your traditional industry? Oh, oh yes, oh yes. Uh, for me, is Rajesh Sethi. Okay. Um, he, he's gold. Uh, I don't know if you've had the opportunity. To I've talked to him, Okay. but oh. like it was just a 30, yeah. 40 minute call. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. I mean, um, one, as a human being, he's just phenomenal. I mean, yeah. uh, I have never come across another person who is so patient, so kind, and just you know. Uh, on the on the other side, uh, from from a mentoring point of view, uh, he's just phenomenal. I think for me, he's been he's been a huge. Would have been your key takeaways or some, some oh, takeaways? Oh, I mean, I can just go endlessly. Uh, first, which I think was was phenomenal for me, and this is going beyond the surface level is that he helped me understand that what you think is native wisdom to you is of high value for someone else. And, you know, yeah, which okay. I think was phenomenal for me, right? Because it, you now see that what skill or what expertise you have, just because it comes to you so naturally, is not what everybody, for it, it does not naturally come for everybody. Mm -hmm. So it's high value, the, the, the value for it is, is, is perceived and seen much higher. I think for me that was huge, right? Because that changed the way I looked at my art or my craft or my uh, expertise about something. Um, I think the second thing was um, from a branding po point of view, like I thought, oh, I knew so much about branding because I've been doing this for the last so many years, if not more than a decade. His rule on um, not to add cognitive load in any branding exercise, I think was phenomenal, which simply meant that most people in their attempt to want to be unique and different, complicate whatever they're doing with their branding. Okay. And he says, if that becomes so, which is high cognitive load for me to just process and understand it, I'm not going to be able to transfer that brand to anybody else. Like imagine you come up to me and say, hey, you know, I'm not able to recall that particular brand I came across. It's lost its purpose. Yeah. Right. So he would say, and I think that came from his skill of being able to use a lot of neuro uh, thinking with language. Uh, the third, which I think is one of the biggest gift to mankind, is what he calls as hunger alignment. Okay. Which is he, whenever he does any deal or any contract or any discussion, he's trying to figure out what you're hungry about is the same thing I need to be hungry about and that alignment needs to happen. If that hunger alignment does not happen, I can never create value for you, you can never create value for me. And the reason I say that is that that has been one of my biggest lessons. So very often when I'm going into a sales pitch or even talking about partnerships, I'm first trying to see what is it that you're hungry about and I'm going to create value to satisfy that hunger and create alignment. Got it. And I think, I like oh, I can just go on and on and on. And I've seen that it's almost like, you know, very often I'm going into a sales pitch and very often I'm able to close it, not realizing why. And I realize that the underlying truth is subconsciously I'm looking at creating hunger alignment. I'm looking at creating, and it goes to this whole, what's in it for them? Nice. You know, and yeah. So, I mean, about Rajesh, I can just go on the whole day. I could have a whole podcast about him, yeah. Uh, we'll do an episode two. Yeah. yeah. Um, what's your question for my next guest? I, I don't know what your next guest yeah, is. Yeah, that's right. Yes. That's the yes, purpose, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I would say I'm looking at being able to define how do you know potential, right? And how do you define potential? Like when I when I look at someone, I have seen folks look at me. I don't know if I'm sounding too narcissistic <laughs> here, but I look at folks and say, "You've got potential, right?" Uh, I struggle to do that, right? 
Um, and basically, very often, potential is being able to see what you're not seeing today. Yeah. Right? But you can see it, it happening in the future. Yeah, how can you, if, if there's a framework, yeah. right? If there's a method to it. I love frameworks more because my, maybe my intelligence is limited and I use frameworks as my way of trying to do things. But is there a framework to say you can tell potential? Cool. Uh, that's all I had for you. Hey. Let's plug you again. So where can people reach out? What, uh, okay. what do you need? Where should they go? Okay. Um, Personally for me, I mean, Instagram uh, okay. is a great place. Instagram.com forward slash Joshua Rosario. And if you want to learn about uh, the shoes, then it's jrosario.com. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Hey, thank you so much, man. This was yeah. fun. This was fun. Yeah.